I'm Emma. My first big break after college was landing a job at Mason Trading Company as a lawyer's assistant. It was a bustling place, always buzzing with activity and ringing phones that hardly ever stopped. I loved the pace, it kept me on my toes. In those early days, while I was still figuring out which elevator took me where, I ran into Tom. He worked in the purchasing department, just a corridor away from our legal offices. He was arguing over the phone about some shipment that got delayed. He hung up, noticed me watching, and rolled his eyes. Suppliers, he muttered. Tough day? I asked, half-smiling. You could say that. Every day is a battlefield here. You knew? Yeah, just started this week. I'm Emma. Tom. Welcome to the madness. Don't let the chaos scare you off. We started having lunch together, mostly because it was easier to navigate the huge cafeteria with someone who knew the place. Tom was easy to talk to, had a sharp wit, and wasn't shy about saying exactly what he thought. One lunch turned into many, and soon, those lunches turned into after-work drinks. Our conversations ranged from mundane work stuff to more personal topics. I learned he was an only child, adored by his mother, but constantly nagged for not living up to his potential, whatever that meant. You haven't met my mom yet, but brace yourself when you do, Tom warned one evening as we grabbed beers after a particularly long day. She has this idea of the perfect woman, and trust me, no one's good enough. It wasn't long before our friendship took a romantic turn. After about a year of dating, Tom proposed. The wedding was simple, but perfect, for us. We bought an apartment together with savings I had from my grandma and his savings. It felt like everything was falling into place. Life with Tom was mostly smooth, except for the occasional bickering about who forgot to buy milk or whose turn it was to clean the apartment. But nothing too heavy, just the usual stuff couples go through. Until one day, everything felt different. I was exhausted all the time, and even the smell of coffee, which I loved, made me nauseous. One morning, struggling to even get out of bed, I decided enough was enough. I booked an appointment with my doctor, thinking maybe I had the flu or something. Sitting in the waiting room, flipping through a magazine without really reading it, my name was finally called. Dr. Lena was always straight to the point, and after a few questions and tests, she dropped the news. Well, Emma, congratulations are in order. You're pregnant. Pregnant? I repeated, the word foreign and heavy. Are you sure? Quite sure, Dr. Lena smiled, handing me the test result. But you need to be careful. Your body's signaling a few warning signs. Nothing too scary, but you need rest, less stress. I nodded, my mind racing. Pregnant. How would Tom react? I couldn't tell over the phone. This needed a face-to-face. -face. Walking through the door of our apartment that evening, I found Tom on the couch, eyes glued to his phone. Tom, we need to talk, I said, my voice shaky. I went to the doctor today. I'm, we're going to have a baby. Tom's face changed. It wasn't the reaction I'd hoped for. A baby? Emma, this is, it's not great timing, you know? We haven't even traveled like we talked about. And a baby? That's a huge change. I felt a pang in my heart. I know it's unexpected, but it's also kind of amazing, right? We're going to be parents. Tom ran his hands through his hair, a sign he was stressed. I don't know, Emma. It's too much. It's too soon. Too soon for a family with me? I asked, hurt coloring my tone. No, that's not what I mean. I just thought we'd have more time, just us two. The conversation went in circles. Tom saying it was bad timing, me trying to highlight the positive. By the end of it, Tom had closed off, and I was left feeling alone, holding on to a piece of news that should have brought us together but instead was pushing us apart. The next day, I spoke to my boss, Mr. Harlow. I needed some accommodation, given the doctor's orders. Mr. Harlow, I need to ask for a change. I'm pregnant, and there are some complications. Could I possibly work from home? Mr. Harlow, who was always more understanding than I gave him credit for, didn't hesitate. 
Of course, Emma. We'll set up everything you need at home. Take care of yourself and the little one. Going home that day, I hoped Tom had softened a bit. But when I told him about the remote work arrangement, his reaction was cold. So, you're just going to be home now? What about all the plans we had? I thought you'd be happy I found a solution to keep the stress down, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Emma, it's like you're not even listening. I said it's too soon for all this, Tom snapped back. I went to bed early that night, feeling the distance between us grow. As I lay there, the reality of my situation sinking in, I realized this journey was going to be tougher than I thought. The air in our apartment felt heavier these days, like each day was a cloudy one, even if the sun was shining outside. Tom's affection seemed to drain away as quickly as it came. He grew more distant, more irritated by the small ways my life had to change because of the pregnancy. He said he felt neglected, like he was second to my health and the baby's needs. His mom, Mrs. Blackwell, was no help either. She called one afternoon, her voice as cold as the winter wind. Emma, this child. It's not the right time. You should be focusing on supporting Tom, not dragging him into fatherhood. I clenched the phone tighter, fighting the sting in my eyes. It's not like I planned this by myself, Mrs. Blackwell. It's our child, not just mine. There are options, you know. You're just choosing the most selfish one. Her words sliced through me, leaving me feeling hollow inside. As if that wasn't enough, Tom's behavior started changing even more. His cologne was masked by another scent, a woman's perfume, unfamiliar and sweet, clinging to his clothes. The first time I smelled it, I convinced myself it was a mix-up at the dry cleaner. But then, it happened again. And again. He also started staying out late, mumbling about needing to catch up on work, and his weekends were booked up with sudden business trips. It was too much to chalk up to coincidence. I held my tongue, not wanting to believe the worst, but the seed of doubt was planted. I couldn't ignore it anymore. That Saturday, when Tom mentioned another business trip, I reached out to Mike, an old classmate who now worked as a detective. We met at a small cafe, the kind where you could talk without every table overhearing your conversation. Mike slid a folder across the table to me. I got what you asked for, Emma. You sure you want to see this? I nodded, not trusting my voice, and opened the folder. The photos were clear, unmistakable. There was Tom, and with him, a woman I recognized from his office, a new hire, that he'd mentioned in passing. Emma, I'm sorry, Mike said, his voice low. There's video too. It's consistent. My heart sank to the soles of my feet. Thanks, Mike. I needed to know. I went home, numb and carrying the folder like it was made of lead. As I turned the key in the lock, the door swung open. Mrs. Blackwell stood there, her face twisted in disapproval. I came to see how you are. Tom said he's worried about you, all alone here. Her eyes darted around, suspiciously. I know about Tom. He's not on a business trip. He's with someone else, Mrs. Blackwell. She scoffed, her defense quick and sharp. You're driving him away. Always sick, complaining, needing things. What man wants that? That's no excuse for cheating, I shot back, anger rising. And you think having his baby will fix things? No one in the family wants this child, Emma. Only you. Her words were like a physical blow. Get out, I said, my voice trembling. Now. She threw her hands up and stormed out, slamming the door behind her. The silence after was deafening. I sat on the couch, feeling numb and hollow. Thirty minutes felt like an eternity as each second passed with heavy, painful ticks, echoing the throbbing in my heart. My mind was racing, but a dreadful resolve settled over me. I had to face Tom and see the truth with my own eyes. Mike had given me all the details I needed. There at the Grandview Hotel, room 718, he'd said, his voice filled with reluctant professionalism. My hands were shaking slightly as I parked the car and walked into the hotel lobby, my stomach in knots. 
I took the elevator, my heart pounding in my ears with each floor it passed. When the doors opened, I stepped out into a brightly lit hallway that felt too cheery for what I was about to do. Room 718 was just down the hall, and as I approached, I could hear laughter and the clinking of glasses. My hand trembled as I knocked on the door. Room service must be here with the champagne. I heard a woman's voice, chirpy and carefree. After a few seconds that felt like hours, the door swung open. Tom looked out, his expression changing from anticipation to shock in an instant. Emma? What, how did you find? I know everything, Tom, I said, my voice stronger than I felt. Without waiting for an invitation, I pushed past him into the room. The sight that greeted me was like a slap, there she was, his mistress, half-dressed, scrambling to cover up as if modesty meant anything now. Tom recovered from his initial shock and his face hardened. Why are you here, Emma? To spy on me? To beg? Beg? I echoed, incredulous, feeling a bitter laugh rise in my throat. I came for the truth, not that you'd know anything about that. He scoffed, stepping closer. You want the truth? Here it is. I'm not happy with you anymore. You're always so wrapped up in yourself and this, this baby. His mistress, now somewhat dressed, smirked and added, Maybe if you paid more attention to him, he wouldn't be with me. Her words stung, but it was his agreement, the nod he gave her, that twisted the knife deeper. Yeah, you should be thanking us. We're just waiting for your baby to be born. Then I can finally move on properly. The room spun around me, and a sharp pain stabbed through my abdomen. I doubled over, gasping, the shock and pain mingling into a nauseating swirl. Tom, I think something's wrong, I managed to say, my voice a whisper of desperation. Please, call an ambulance. He and his mistress exchanged a look, a quick, dismissive glance, and then he turned back to me. You're probably just overreacting, like always. They dressed quickly, stepping over me as if I were just another obstacle in their path. The last thing I saw before darkness claimed me was the closing door, the click of it shutting echoing ominously in the cold, empty room. I woke up to the gentle, yet urgent, voice of a maid trying to rouse me. Ma'am? Ma'am, can you hear me? Her face swam into view as I blinked away the darkness clouding my vision. The pain was still there, a dull ache that seemed to echo through my entire body. Where am I? My voice sounded hoarse, foreign even to my own ears. You're still in the hotel room, dear. I found you on the floor. I'm calling an ambulance now. True to her word, the next thing I knew, I was being wheeled through the emergency room. The hospital lights were harsh, blinding, as nurses and doctors swarmed around, their voices a cacophony of concern that I could barely comprehend. They asked questions, too many questions, but all I could think about was the betrayal and the pain. Tom never showed up at the hospital. Neither did his mother. Calls went unanswered, their silence more painful than any physical wound. By the time the doctor came with the news, that I had lost the baby, the grief was so heavy, so overwhelming, it was all I could do not to scream. The loss was not just a personal tragedy, it felt like an injustice, one that Tom, his mistress, and his mother had a hand in. They had abandoned me, left me alone at my most vulnerable. The bitterness and anger stood inside me, brewing a storm. After what felt like an eternity, the hospital discharged me. I drove straight to our apartment, and began packing Tom's things. Each shirt I folded, each sock I threw into the box, was a severance, a cutting of ties. With his belongings piled in the trunk of my car, I drove to Mrs. Blackwell's house. I didn't bother with niceties. I unloaded his things right in the driveway, letting them fall wherever they may. I didn't knock, I just walked in. Mrs. Blackwell was sitting in the living room, a look of resignation on her face. She knew why I was there. Emma, she started, her tone weary. You should just leave. Take what dignity you have left. Dignity? I laughed, but there was no humor in it. You think I came here for a lecture on dignity from you? He's my son. I stand by him. And he will be better off without you. She said bluntly. He has excellent lawyers. 
you'll only embarrass yourself. At that, something snapped inside me. Do you even care that your grandchild is gone? That your son left me alone in a hotel room to lose his child? Her eyes flickered away, unable to meet mine. It's a tough situation. It's done, Emma. I stepped closer, my voice low and steady. How did you feel, as a mother, knowing what happened? Knowing your grandchild was lost? She didn't answer, just looked away, a crack in her composed facade. I will see your son in court, I said, the words heavy with promise. You can tell him that. Turning on my heel, I left her sitting there, alone with the weight of her choices. As I walked back to my car, the cool air felt sharp against my skin, but my path had never been clearer. I would fight. Not just for me, but for the life that was lost, and for the truth that needed seeing the light of day. Stepping into the courthouse, I felt every eye on me, or maybe it was just the weight of what was about to happen pressing down. My best friend from college, Lucy, was right beside me. She'd become a shark in the courtroom, known for tearing apart even the slickest defense. When I told her about everything, she didn't hesitate. I've got this, Emma. And don't worry about the fees. This one's on me, Lucy had said, her voice fierce and reassuring. We sat at our table, papers neatly arranged, evidence at the ready. Across from us, Tom and his mistress looked confident, a smugness that irked me. As the proceedings began, their lawyer painted a picture of me as unstable, broken by grief into fabricating stories. The plaintiff has suffered immense emotional distress, yes, which has led to these wild accusations. There is no substantial evidence of any affair or wrongdoing on my client's part. When it was our turn, Lucy stood, her presence commanding the room. Your Honor, not only do we have substantial evidence, but we also have a testimony that will corroborate everything my client has claimed. She presented the photos first, clear and undeniable proof of the affair, passed around for the judge and eventually to the opposing counsel who looked visibly shaken as they viewed them. Next, Lucy played the video from the hotel. The room fell silent as the scene played out, I enter the hotel, then Tom and his mistress, laughing, hugging, leave the hotel without a hint of concern. But that's not all, Lucy continued. She called the maid who found me to the stand. Her testimony was simple, but powerful. I found her on the floor, unconscious. They were gone. She could have died. Tom's face had gone white, and his mistress couldn't sit still, her leg bouncing nervously. When they were given a chance to respond, Tom stood up, his voice shaky. This, this isn't how it looks. We were just, scared and confused. Scared? So you leave your pregnant wife unconscious on the floor? Lucy shot back, her tone icy. The judge took everything into consideration, the weight of the evidence, the testimonies. After what felt like a lifetime, he spoke, I find in favor of the plaintiff, Emma Blackwell. The evidence of infidelity and negligence is overwhelming. I am granting a 50-50 division of all marital assets, as well as financial compensation for the emotional distress caused by the actions of the defendants. As we walked out of the courtroom, Lucy elbowed me gently, a victorious glint in her eye. How's that for justice? I managed a small smile, feeling a mix of relief and sorrow. Thanks, Lucy. I couldn't have done this without you. Life had been limping back to normal after the courtroom drama. I bought a small apartment, and every new piece of furniture, every picture hung, was a step away from my past torment. The only shadow that loomed over my fresh start was seeing Tom and his mistress together at work, a constant reminder of the betrayal. One afternoon, as I was sorting through some legal briefs, my phone buzzed with a number I hadn't seen in a while. It was Tom's mother, Mrs. Blackwell. Emma, could we meet? I, I need to talk to you. Her voice trembled over the phone. I hesitated, memories of our last encounter flashing through my mind. Why should I meet you, Mrs. Blackwell? It's about Tom and your company. Please, I wouldn't ask if it wasn't important. Curiosity peaked and a bit of old loyalty to the company that stood by me, I agreed. We met at a small cafe, away from prying eyes. She looked worn, her eyes rimmed with red, as if she had been crying. 
Tom, he's not the boy I raised anymore. She started, not meeting my eyes. He and that woman, they're planning to cheat the company, sell off assets, and, and they want to force me out of my home. Her words hung heavy between us. I was still processing when she grabbed my hand, her grip surprisingly strong. Please, you're the only one I can trust to stop this. The plea in her eyes was real, but so was my reluctance. Mrs. Blackwell, your family drama is not my business anymore. It's not just family, Emma. It's your company too. They're planning something big. It could ruin everything. Her urgency struck a chord. I was, after all, part of that company. It had given me a chance when I was just a college grad, and many of my colleagues were like family. All right, I'll look into it. I conceded, more for the company than for her. Back at work, I started digging. I quietly pulled records and contracts, tracing the trail of transactions Tom and his mistress were involved in. It didn't take long to spot irregularities. The numbers didn't add up, goods were being purchased at inflated prices, far above market value. Armed with evidence, I made my way to the director's office. Laying the documents on his desk, I watched his eyes narrow as he scanned the evidence. This is serious, Mr. Harlow stated flatly, looking up at me. I'll handle this from here. Thank you, Emma. You may have just saved this company from a significant loss. Leaving his office, I felt a mix of relief and anticipation. Walking past Tom and his mistress, I caught snippets of their mocking laughter. I couldn't help but smile to myself, justice had a way of finding its path, no matter how twisted the road might be. After exposing Tom and his mistress, a full-scale investigation rippled through the company. As it unfolded, I was often called to testify, detailing every discrepancy and irregular transaction I had uncovered. The courtroom once again became a familiar setting, but this time, I stood confidently, bolstered by the truth and the mountains of evidence that supported our claims. The legal battles were intense and draining. Tom and his mistress faced the consequences head-on. The company, having suffered significant potential losses, pursued justice relentlessly, culminating in a multi-million dollar lawsuit against the duo. The verdict was as expected, guilty. The court's decision barred them from holding any senior positions in the future, a fitting end to their corporate malfeasance. Amidst the chaos, my own career took a surprising but welcome turn. The company recognized my efforts and promoted me to a senior lawyer, an acknowledgement that came with a significant award. One quiet afternoon, as I was organizing files in my new office, a spacious room with a view of the city skyline, my phone rang. The screen displayed a number I hadn't seen in a long while. Mrs. Blackwell. Emma, it's me, her voice came through, tinged with humility, a stark contrast to our last encounters. I, I wanted to thank you for saving my home from being sold out from under me. Her gratitude was genuine, and despite everything, I felt a twinge of sympathy for her. You're welcome. I did what I felt was right. There was a pause, a breath of silence, before she added, I was wrong about you, Emma. So very wrong. I used to think you didn't deserve my son, but I've come to realize it was he who didn't deserve you. Her words, unexpected and raw, took me by surprise. Thank you for saying that. It means more than you might know. Could we meet? I'd like to apologize properly, face to face, she suggested, a hint of hope in her tone. I considered her request. All right, Mrs. Blackwell. Let's meet. We decided on a quiet cafe, neutral ground, for what was to be a frank conversation. Sitting across from her, I saw the changes the months had wrought on her. Gone was the haughty demeanor, replaced by a somber reflectiveness. Emma, I'm sorry for everything. I was blinded by my own expectations, my own desires for Tom, that I couldn't see the truth. You were always the stronger person, and I admire that deeply now. She confessed, her eyes not meeting mine. It's been a tough journey for us all, I acknowledged, my voice steady. But your apology is accepted, Mrs. Blackwell. We talked more, about life, about lessons learned. It was clear that friendship wasn't on the table, but mutual respect hung in the balance, a fine thread that connected our shared history. 
Leaving the cafe, I felt lighter, as if her words had lifted some of the shadows of the past. I walked back to my office, past the now empty desks of Tom and his mistress, a reminder of the bullet dodged. Their laughter no longer echoed through the halls, instead, my own steps sounded a steady beat towards the future.